It's great to see you again. Um, I'm hopeful that you've had a chance to see most of these uh, lectures that involve the emergence of a post-war America. We've sliced and diced this in a number of different ways at this point in the semester, and we've certainly talked about uh, how our political system will change a little bit, certainly our political culture. Um, we've talked a little bit about how this will spill over into um, social relations. We discussed the emergence of the second Red Scare not so long ago, but we really haven't talked about how this post-war period is going to affect our economy, and uh, that's really what I want to get into with this lecture that you have right here. Um, it's not often that I have a chance to, uh, to, to tell you something, to teach you something from history by simply using a, uh, an image alone. But if you're following along in the PowerPoint with me and you're taking a look at that, um, that, 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 that slide there entitled The Great Kitchen Debate, uh, one of those individuals in that photograph ought to be pretty familiar to you. Uh, if you look at the guy in the dark suit that's speaking to the guy in the gray colored suit, most of you will recognize uh, the dark colored suit gentleman to be none other than the Vice President of the United States, Richard Nixon. Nixon is lecturing uh, the guy next to him, who is the premier of the Soviet Union, the uh, uh, one and only Nikita Khrushchev. He's lecturing Khrushchev on the, on the benefits and the merits of the capitalist system. And basically what he's saying is, we're better than you, and you look no further than capitalism to explain why. In particular, he's pointing out the model American kitchen that was on display at the Moscow exhibition in 1959. This was a massive exhibi uh, ex exhibition, and one of the things that they had on display was this new and improved American model kitchen, and it had all the latest and greatest kitchen advancements and gadgets and you name it. And what Nixon is telling Khrushchev there is none of this, none of it would have been possible without capitalism because capitalism thrives on competition. And so if GE wants to remain at the helm of the industry, it's got to find bells and whistles to add to gadgets and contraptions that make life infinitely easier and, 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 and happier for the American consumer. And not only do they have to do that, they have to do so at the cheapest price possible. That's what you get when you have capitalistic competition, and that's Nixon's argument when it comes to Nikita Khrushchev. Um, the fact of the matter is, Nixon's, Nixon's right about a lot of things when it comes to the economy of the post-war period. We are talking about a vibrant, strong, robust economy. He's just not telling you the, 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 the entirety of the story. Um, what he's not telling you is, although you do see new faces come into what you might consider to be mainstream middle-class America, wealth is still stubbornly, stubbornly concentrated at the highest levels of the American economy. Um, and although there are these new faces, there, there certainly will be challenges, uh, much of which is going to be based on race. Uh, there will be clear-cut challenges in the world to come. Okay, uh, But I want to get back into this whole issue of American economic might in the post-World War II period. There are a lot of re reasons for this. Uh, it's multifaceted, really. Uh, you have to take into consideration where World War II was fought. And generally speaking, it was fought in Europe and it was fought in Asia. Okay, We're going to be one of the only combatants that emerged from the war completely unscathed. Uh, outside of what happened in Hawaii with Pearl Harbor, uh, we really don't see any too much of disruption of our national markets. And so by the standards of the rest of the global leaders in the economy, uh, we emerge not only in one piece, but with a greater propensity to, uh, to produce. We've got more capacity to produce than before the war. Another reason is federal assistance. Federal government was pumping millions, billions even, uh, dollars into research, science, and industry uh, during the war years simply to win the war. Uh, you get a lot of really neat inventions that come out of this federal assistance, uh, one of which is uh, what you call computers and or the internet. 
Um, now, obviously, I don't mean like uh, the computer that you're using right now to view this video or anything like that, but the, the, the skeleton, the outline, the conceptualization, much of it is, is, is hatched during these war years, or at least the very aftermath of, the, of, of World War II uh, that would come to be what you call um, uh, uh, computers, internet, things of that variety. Another very important invention that's really developed during the war time uh, would be the television. And by 1947, there was a TV in almost every American household in the United States. Uh, that's another explanation in terms of this economic powerhouse. But the big one, the big one is the GI Bill of Rights. Now, we've talked about this in this class before. We know that it was Franklin Roosevelt's idea to, um, to, to have an economic Bill of Rights that would have applied to all Americans, and Congress shot it down. What we got was the next best thing. It was called the Readjustment Act, but ultimately it's going to come to be known as the GI Bill of Rights, which entitles all American GIs uh, to things like a free education, um, cheap housing loans, health care through the Veterans Administration, uh, money, um, whether through loans or startup capital, to start businesses, to start farms. But what I want you to understand about the GI Bill is that it's a stimulus to the American economy, and not just a little bit, a lot, a huge stimulant to the American economy. I mean, you have to understand that from the perspective of our good friend Jurgis Rudkis, uh, if you recall from the jungle, the idea that Jurgis is going to go to college one day and come out with a degree and some skill or profession, that was a pipe dream before the war. And now when these guys start coming back from the war and even after the war, once this becomes a mainstream fixture on the American economy, um, this is going to produce millions of new college graduates, which in addition to becoming professionals and consumers, uh, you, you are going to see a real boon to the American workforce in the sense that for the first time in American economic history, you've got professionally trained um, engineers, professionally trained managers, uh, architects. You, you, you get the idea, right? Anyway, a few other explanations in terms of this economic might. Bottom line is, nobody was able to buy anything during the war, primarily because Chevrolet, uh, Sunbeam, General Electric, that they were not producing for the civilian market, they were producing for the wartime market. And so what you have is forced savings. Uh, people didn't have a choice, they had to save. And when the war ended, they were desperately wanting to buy stuff. And, and, and God bless corporate America for giving them great stuff to buy. All kinds of new and cool inventions that come out. Uh, I've mentioned the television that, that sold crazy. Uh, dishwashers, dryers, labor-saving devices that made life in America infinitely, infinitely more enjoyable than before the war. Um, you do have to understand that there's some drawbacks to this as well. Uh, to this point, I've really made this connection between wartime spending and the growing American economy. One of the individuals that warned about the danger of too much military spending was uh, none other than the President of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower. Okay? He doesn't exactly seem like all that likely of a person to sound the alarm when it comes to military spending, considering um, he spent quite a bit on the military. Uh, as we found out, and not only that, he's a former military man. But on his last day in office, what Eisenhower is going to do is he's going to coin the term military-industrial complex. And what he means by this is that by spending so much money on our military, you're really empowering these defense contractors. And those same contractors, not only are they going to be very powerful, uh, they're going to like this relationship in the sense that they're, they're going to like this state of almost perpetual war mobilization, which they could maybe be, have an incentive to continuously have a bad guy for the American people. This is what Dwight Eisenhower worried about when it comes to what he called his, uh, excuse me, the military industrial complex. So as you can see, there's costs and benefits associated with military spending. 
I'd like to talk a little bit about how this new corporate order looked in the post-war period. If there's one word that you could use to describe it, I think it would be standardization. What emerges from the post-war period is a very standardized, nothing to love about it, product that would be consumed by millions and millions of Americans. Um, here's the reason for that. During the war, what we wanted were companies, corporations, organizations that could produce on a massive, massive level. And so when it came to producing for the war, it, it, it was companies like Phillips Morris that got the contract to produce cigarettes. It was Anheuser-Busch that got the, the contract, the government contract, to produce beer. They could produce in quantities that could simply dwarf some of your smaller producers, and therefore, naturally, um, they, they made quite a bit of money during the war years. And flush with this money, what happened in the aftermath of the war is they began buying up a lot of their competitors. And so, in the case of beer, what, what happens is some of your smaller brewers are bought up by Anheuser-Busch, some of your larger uh, uh, beer producers, and what comes out is not something that's all that unique uh, uh, if you're a beer connoisseur, Budweiser tastes like beer, sort of, I guess. Um, but in any case, it, uh, it, it's very standardized. Uh, maybe an even better example would be McDonald's. Um, for those of you that uh, have been through the drive through recently, it'll say 100% beef patty on your quarter pounder. Uh, but if, if you like a good burger, you, you'll know that that, uh, that leaves a little bit to the imagination when it comes to 100% beef, or at least what, what a good 100% beef burger tastes like. So no, nothing to love about this new uh, corporate product, but, but certainly uh, there, there's this ability to produce uh, in quantities that, that, that make the supply so high that more and more people are able to afford to buy this stuff, right? And what these um, corporations looked for to run their multi-billion dollar entities would be an army of white-collared workers. Now keep in mind, guys, for the first time in American history, we've got more people going to college than ever before. And what's coming out are these professionally trained um, marketers, financers, managers, businessmen. Um, what historians typically call these white-collar workers would be the organization man. Okay, the organization man um, got a job for life, and that was the good part about it. Uh, he got a job, and that job was there for the rest of his life, and there was a promise to be able to move up in the company for more pay, more responsibility, um, more prestige. But the cost that this organization man paid for that job forever would be really two things. Number one, you were absolutely expected to take orders. Uh, yes, sir, may I have another, right? And number two, this whole idea of testing the waters to see if, uh, you know, the, the company down the road would pay you a little bit better, maybe they had a better retirement package, maybe more vacation days, that, things like that. That was unheard of in the post-war economy. Nobody got that kind of thing, right? The organization man was supposed to pledge his undying loyalty to that corporation, okay? So it very much is a give and a take dynamic here, but it's also a pretty good explanation in terms of this booming American economy. For the first time in American history, you actually have a blue-collared um, um, alternative to accompany this, this, this expanding economy in the professions. The man that you're looking at on the PowerPoint there is a guy from Detroit by the name of Walter P. Ruther, and he's a rising star in labor and working class history. Um, in 1945, what Ruther is going to do as the vice president of the United Automobile Workers is he's going to take on the richest, largest, most powerful corporation in the world at the time, and that was General Motors. What Ruther demanded as a union leader is he demanded a 30% increase in worker wages. 
That's not what really made this radical. What made this demand radical was that he also demanded that General Motors not raise prices on its products, that it leave the price of its cars and its trucks at the same price before this wage raise, and therefore they could not accuse the workers of, of, of raising prices on the American consumers. That's what made it all that radical. Well, as you might imagine, General Motors fights this process tooth and nail, and what comes to be known as the GM strike is going to rage on for over 110 days. It's going to be one of the most expensive work stoppages in American economic history, and it'll end with both sides declaring victory. Um, what GM gave up was, was basically what you might think of as bread and butter issues. Workers got their raise. They got that 30% raise. That's a big, big deal. That's more purchasing power. That's a lot of good things, right? They got what we would call fringe benefits. Uh, they got health insurance. They got paid vacation. They got sick leave. They got things that made life much more secure from a working perspective. Um, I, I guess really what workers got out of this would be access to the middle class. Uh, these jobs allowed the American working class to buy those homes uh, that they so desperately wanted to buy up until this point, uh, to take vacations, to send their children to college. In short, what, what workers got, uh, or maybe better yet, what workers became, was, was blue-collared middle-class Americans. What General Motors got was the right to manage its business, if you will. In other words, unions will go ahead and we will negotiate pay raises with you, health care benefits with you, but we draw the line there. You don't have any right to tell us how we can or cannot manage our business. So when it comes to the pricing of our products, that's not your business, that's our business. Um, this is, by, by 1950, this is going to become known as the Labor Management Accord. Some people like to call it the uh, Treaty of Detroit. Essentially what you mean really is the same thing. What managers and workers come to the agreement on is that workers would be paid very solid middle class wages and, and have access to the middle class life. In exchange for that, they, they would not strike as often and they would stay out of businesses, business, so to speak. Understand something. This is a temporary peace offering. And by the 1970s, with a changing economy, the business community is going to come back full force, and ultimately, they're, they're really going to abandon this labor management accord. But we'll talk about that a little bit more in the semester. For right now, I want to ask you, what do you think, you, what, what do you think all of this affluence bought? And the shortest answer I can give you is a little slice of the American dream. It bought what we call suburbia, okay? Now, understand something. Suburbia, as, as we understand it, did, did not exist before the war started, okay? Suburbia is very much uh, an outgrowth of the post-war period. In New York, uh, Long Island, New York, there is a guy by the name of William J. Levitt, and he's a housing contractor. And what Levitt's really going to do is he's going to marry the idea of mass production to home construction. Essentially, he's going to tear a page out of Henry Ford's playbook. He's going to mass produce houses. This hadn't been done before. But if you roll through any you know, suburban neighborhood around this area, um, you, you'll see his work on full display. The house next to one house looks very, very similar. In some cases, they're just different colors. They look a lot alike, the house across the street. It's pretty clear what happened was a housing contractor came in here, bought this land, and started plopping down these little mini McMansions. That was Levitt. That was what your Levitt home was. Um, there was a songwriter, a folk singer, really, a guy by the name of Pete Seeger, uh, that performed this song, Little Boxes, and, 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 and the lyrics of that song, Little Boxes, um, they, they, they drive at this idea that all the houses, uh, he calls it ticky-tacky, but uh, really what he means, all these houses made out of ticky-tacky, they're all the same. They've all been mass-produced. Um, Seeger went further than that, though. He also said that the people inside these houses 
we're all the same. And to that extent, he's, he's very right. These suburban neighborhoods came complete with what used to be called restrictive housing covenants. What these were were agreements between the homeowner and the neighborhood that if you ever sold your home, you would only sell it to a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant family. These neighborhoods were racially exclusive. Um, they were places where single men were not welcome. Keep, keep in mind, to be single during the 1950s was to be a little bit suspicious, and suspicious was the last thing that you wanted to be labeled during this period. Um, in some cases, they were not open to religions like Catholics or Jews. Uh, they were very, very exclusive regions and would remain so well through the 1960s. Okay? Um, this is very much a part of this uh, culture of conformity that I need to talk to you about now. This culture of conformity is going to emerge in the aftermath of World War II, and it does emphasize conforming to accepted, respectable, middle-class values. Values that emphasize go through high school and get into a good college. Why? So you can get a good job and buy a white picket fence in the suburbs. Why? So you can get married to your high school or college sweetheart and have kids. Why? Because it's what everybody's supposed to do. You're supposed to want to do this. And as a matter of fact, to not want to do this process that I've just got done describing to you would be considered crazy. Uh, there's a book that I bet you're familiar with. It's called The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. And uh, you, if you read that book, you'll find out at the end of that story that the main character, Holden Caulfield, was institutionalized by his father uh, for, for basically not wanting this middle-class life. Now, there's all kinds of different realms and facets of the culture of conformity, and you're looking at one right now, if you're following along with me, and that's the nuclear family. Um, families were very big in the, in, in the post-war period, and I mean that literally and figuratively speaking. Not only was this a big part of the culture of conformity, what you're supposed to do, but families were large. It was not uncommon to have double-digit households in, in the post-war American family. Uh, you might even say that nuclear families were, were, were almost deified um, in, in American culture at the time as being uh, very, very wholesome and, and a great guard against uh, creeping socialism. Right? Uh, another aspect of this culture of conformity is a religious awakening. Church attendance, membership, however you want to define it, is, is approaching all-time highs. Um, one reason as to why is the gentleman that you're looking at on the screen there, the great Reverend Billy Graham. Uh, Graham's going to become one of America's first televangelists. He's going to use the invention of TV to uh, spread the gospel, so to speak. But generally speaking, what he's going to do is, is he's really going to reawaken, at least on a social level, reawaken a sleeping giant, and that would be evangelical Christians. Now, he's not necessarily reawakening them in a political sense, but this, this, this reawakening does dovetail very, very squarely with this development of the Cold War. Americans are looking at uh, our sober, church-going, hard-working society as the alternative to godless communism. It's during this time period that we inscribe, in God we trust unto our currency, and we put the phrase, one nation under God, in our, uh, in our Pledge of Allegiance. It's a very religiously conscious time period, this post-war time period. Okay? We also see the return of gender roles. We begin to see the return of man as this, uh, the provider and woman the bearer of the children, the keeper of the home. In 1962, uh, there'd be a later feminist by the name of Betty Friedan that uh, wrote this book called The Feminine Mystique. Uh, today, I think what we would call The Feminine Mystique is the idea of the glass ceiling. We know that had it not been for the American women, uh, we're not able to produce in World War II the way that we did. And I'm hopeful that you understand that our ability to produce was absolutely paramount 
when it comes to success in the war. Um, that mentality is very much going to be thrown aside during the post-war period. And a lot of those ladies that had, had been so instrumental in the war effort are expected to give up their jobs and return to the life of the domestic sphere, so to speak. You see marriage ages decline um, for both men and women, but from the perspective of women, this kind of drives directly at this feminine mystique, the idea that uh, on paper we say that women can do anything, but the reality of the situation is quite different. Um, there are not as many opportunities for women as there are for men, and therefore a lot of women get married because it's, it's, it's one of their only options. Okay? So the return of gender roles is another very important part of this culture of conformity. Uh, there are social implications of this as well. I mentioned this a second ago, but I want to be very clear. The expectation is not only are you supposed to grow up and get married, but you're supposed to have babies, lots of them. Um, when these veterans start coming home and they start, um, they, 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 they start getting married and they start buying their houses in the suburbs, they start having lots of babies. And there's a huge spike in the birth rate, and, and we call this the baby boom. If you watch the news or read, um, you'll know that there's a generation that are referred to as baby boomers. And these are people that are born uh, in the aftermath of World War II, and they are the product of these people of this post-war period that, that we're talking about. Now, the baby boom is important because, you know, it, it's obviously going to be a stimulant to the economy. Um, but it, there's, there's a cultural attitude here as to what you're supposed to provide for these children. The post-war period is going to see advances in diets, um, more food, better food. You're going to see advancement in public health and medicine. Um, Jonas Salk is going to develop the uh, uh, vaccine for, for polio, the, the disease that crippled Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, you'll see other miracle uh, drugs like penicillin come out during this time period. And so we're healthier than we ever have been before. And uh, the baby boom uh, is, is very much a part of this uh, growing advancement in public health and medicine. Um, we've got to educate these kids. Uh, we begin to see more schools being built. Um, it's really during this time period that you see some mainstream names in American higher education that you think of as world-renowned research institutions, um, they become world-renowned research institutions during the post-war period. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but uh, you, you could point to some cow colleges, if you will, um, uh, before World War II. It's, it's really um, World War II and the aftermath of it that, that turns in some of these state and technical research institutions as the pillars of the American education system that you think of them as today. Um, all of this stimulates the American economy, K through 12, higher education. These kids are, are really bringing the American economy to new levels, right? And speaking of these kids, youth culture as we would recognize it as modern 21st century Americans, is really born during, during this post-war period. Really, the concept of teens and teenagers is really born, right? Um, keep in mind, guys, not only do you not have the ability to buy anything during the war years, um, you, you've got mom and whoever, whatever other adult is in the household at the time, they're all at work. And so somebody's got to watch the little ones. And it was your 11, 12, 13-year-olds that were watching the kids during the war, and they were paid babysitting money. Not much, but you get the idea. And so what these teenagers, they're certainly teenagers by the end of the war, what they emerged with the war from, uh, or from the war with, rather, would be money. And pretty soon, corporate analysts begin to crunch the numbers, and there's a big, big market there in in, in, in teenagers and teen markets. So we see the, the, the marketing of things like rock and roll. Now everybody knows that guy that's on the um, that's on the screen there, that's Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. Um, but you have to understand that the, the kind of music that made Elvis famous was not really something that 
emerged in the white community. Rhythm and blues, that, that was an African-American form of cultural expression. If you've ever been to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you'll know that it's in Cleveland, Ohio. And that's because there was a DJ, a very famous DJ, um, that used to play what he called race records. And uh, really what he meant was rhythm and blues records. And he always would say, if I could find this white man that could give me that black sound, I, I could make him a millionaire overnight. And he found them in Elvis, right? Elvis sold millions and millions of records, primarily because he was quite controversial and um, American teens ate it up the same way that young people in the jazz era um, listened to jazz because you know their, their parents didn't like it. It was controversial. That's what made it fun. Right? Teen movies. Um, Marlon Brando, if you're following along with me still, in The Wild One, uh, we think of that movie as a as a classic today, but the bottom line was it was generally it was it was something that you would you would call a teen movie, a teener bop movie, uh, dur during its 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 era, right? Um, it's very much because there there's a market for all of this as well. Youth culture, generally speaking, is is emerging during this post war period, and its reason is primarily economic. But there might be one. One exception, one very noticeable exception to all of this, and that'd be the beatniks, right? Now, for your notes, what the beatniks are is an underground, shall we say, countercultural movement. Yeah, I really hesitate to call it a movement. It's not really moving anywhere. But generally speaking, what I need you to know about the beatniks is they mocked post-war economy. They, they, they mocked this culture that emphasized fitting in and middle-class values and things of that variety. They emphasized being different, and they emphasized diversity, critical thought. The thing about the beatniks that I need you to understand is that they're really going to be the cultural predecessors of the hippies, the counterculture movement of the 1960s and early 1970s. But there's a very key difference that well, I also want you to be mindful of. The hippies are trying to destroy various elements of American society. Uh, marriage is probably the best example that I can give to you, the idea of marriage being oppressive and so on and so forth. Um, that's why they wanted to destroy it. The beatniks are not necessarily in that business. They're mocking marriage. Uh, they're mocking this uh, white-collared worker that gets up, up, gets up every day at 6 o'clock in the morning to get to work. Um, but they're not trying to destroy it, right? Um, you'll see what I mean a little bit more once we get to this counterculture movement. But for right now, I'm hopeful that you can understand uh, how and why the United States emerges into the post-war period as a superpower, not only militarily, but a superpower as far as our economy is concerned as well. I'll see you later.